This is lecture 8 in Principles of Metabolism. In this lecture we will look at cofactors and vitamins from a metabolic perspective. So cofactors are usually uh, defined and, and presented as a molecule which is required by an enzyme. Usually some smaller organic molecule that has to fit into the enzyme and sort of help it carry out its reaction. Uh, so this is the classic uh, definition. Uh, and this is an example shown here. This is thiamine phosphate, which is a, a common cofactor in many uh, enzymes in carbohydrate metabolism. So this is a sensible definition, but it's not uh, super useful for the way we want to think about cofactors to analyze metabolism. So we'll, we'll look at this a bit differently. So the way I'd like to define a cofactor is from the perspective of a metabolic pathway and flux through a metabolic pathway. So I'll define a cofactor as something that is required for a process or a metabolic pathway, but which is not consumed by it. So here's an example of what I mean. So this is lower glycolysis, glyceraldehyde being converted in a few steps into lactate. And in this process, uh, NAD is important. So in one step it is reduced to NADH, and then in a later step uh, is it, oxidized, it is oxidized back to NAD again. So if you look at this pathway as a whole, NAD and NADH are cofactors in the sense that they are not consumed by the process. They are required for this pathway to function, for glyceraldehyde to be converted to lactate. Uh, but if you look at the net synthesis of the pathway, NAD is, is not a product or a substrate. It's not consumed. So you can see this easily by writing down the sum formula for a pathway. So if you do that for lower glycolysis, you see that NAD drops out because it cancels in this step uh, and it is no longer present. Uh, so then you can recognize that this is uh, a cofactor in this sense uh, for the pathway. Uh, so ADP and ATP you can tell are different uh, and the phosphate ion as well. So these appear in the sum formula. And this is an, an important product, of course, of the pathway uh, to extract energy from glyceraldehyde as ATP. Another sort of variant of this is to think about um, a moiety, so a part of a molecule. That could also be considered a cofactor in a sense. So if we think about this pathway again, uh, look more closely at the ATP production. So we said that, well, ATP is a product. Well, yes, it is a product, but if you think about a moiety, so a substructure uh, of, of ATP, you can recognize that the whole ADP part uh, of, the, of the molecule is, of course, conserved here. All that happens is that this phosphate group, group gets tagged on, so ADP is phosphorylated. So, in a way, you can also think of ADP, the moiety, the part of the molecule, as a cofactor. So this entire part stays the same throughout the, the, uh, uh, the process. And the only product, really, is the phosphate group that is added on here. So that's kind of important, because in many situations we have to distinguish between what actual part of a molecule is being synthesized. So in energy metabolism, the phosphate group uh, continues to cycle. It gets uh, phosphorylated, tagged onto ADP to make ATP, uh, and then it gets removed again in, in reactions that utilize the energy. Uh, but the sort of carrier part of this, the ADP moiety, stays constant. So you can think about that as a cofactor as well. So I mentioned the word carrier. Um, so one nice perspective of cofactors is uh, the idea that they carry things. So it's kind of a, a handle. Uh, little parts of molecules can be attached to this, and then it's carried throughout the cell and used in various places. So you can think of cofactors as a way of transporting uh, little building blocks that make up metabolic pathways. So acetyl-CoA is probably the most uh, well-known example. So you have the, um, the coenzyme A part, which is the cofactor. Uh, that's this entire structure. Uh, that acts as the carrier. And then you have this uh, smaller group, the acetyl group, which is the part that's really 
uh, active in metabolism and, and interchanging, getting exchanged between different pathways. Uh, and you can summarize this structure like this and just write CoA for this whole thing. And the reason for that is, in this case, the internal structure of, of the cofactor is not really important. It looks very complicated, but we don't really have to care what it looks like. Uh, in many situations in metabolism, we do care about structures. They are very important, but they are important when they actually react and something happens to it. Uh, in this case, this entire part, this moiety of acetyl-CoA is, uh, is inert. It doesn't change in reactions. This is the business end. This is the only thing that actually changes. So therefore, that's the only thing we really have to think about in terms of structure. So coenzyme A is, uh, is a well-known uh, carrier. Uh, there are many others uh, in metabolism. So here's uh, a list of a few of these. Uh, and you can really see that this is kind of a list of specialized molecules that carry specific building blocks. So coenzyme A carries groups of two carbons, acyl groups. Uh, folate, tetrahydrofolate in the active form, uh, carries one carbon groups in different oxidation states. So these kind of things, methyl groups, formyl groups, things like that. Uh, another carrier, methionine. Again, it's not super important uh, what the actual structure is, so we don't really care about the name either. Uh, but there's some kind of carrier called SAM uh, that can carry methyl groups. So same as this, but active in, in, in a bit different uh, pathways. Uh, and then you have the electron carriers. Well, electrons, is that really a, a metabolite? Well, it really carries hydride ions, to be precise. But the important part is that it carries something that is uh, an important product of a metabolic pathways. So electrons, in this case, is an important form of energy that is carried. So that's NAD, NADP. Uh, you have many others. Heme carries oxygen. ATP and other triphosphates, as we know, carries the high energy phosphate groups. Uh, UDP, um, the uh, uh, uridine dinucleotide phosphate, is an important carrier in some cases for sugars and amino sugars in some pathways. Uh, CTP, the cytosine triphosphate, uh, is important in lipid metabolism, where it carries uh, certain groups that are used to build lipids. So there's a variety of these, there are others. Uh, and it's a nice perspective, I think, to think about these as, as transporters and these building blocks as kind of the, uh, the material that makes up metabolism. It is important also to say that this differs from enzyme-bound cofactors. So if we think about thiamine phosphate, as we had in the first slide, fitting to the uh, transketolase enzyme, that's really kind of a, a part of the enzyme, a structural component. Uh, and if it's enzyme bound, covalently bound, it doesn't really go away. So it's really part of the enzyme and we don't really have to care about the enzyme bound cofactor so much when we analyze metabolism. So these things, the carriers are different because they actually diffuse throughout the cell and therefore they can go between pathways and, and exchange groups. So they have a different function. So one interesting perspective of carriers is that they can compartmentalize metabolism. So we saw this before in the lecture on, on redox metabolism, that uh, NAD and NADP, they both carry hydride groups or high energy electrons, uh, but they specialize. So NAD is used a lot in oxidative pathways to extract energy from, from compounds. And NADP uh, is used a lot in, in reductive metabolism, in, in biosynthesis, where you use energy to build compounds. So this kind of divides uh, oxidative and reductive metabolism into two different compartments. Uh, and this is important so that the cell can uh, independently control uh, these two parts of metabolism. That's compartmentalization. Uh, there are other examples of this if you look at other carriers. So one example is folate versus SAM. So these are two carriers that both handle one carbon groups, uh, so methyl groups and uh, one carbon in other oxidation states. Uh, but they specialize a bit. So folate uh, handles one carbon uh, and um, 
uses it for nucleotide synthesis largely. Whereas SAM uh, also carries methyl groups, but it uses it for other sort of general methylation reactions, methylates proteins, uh, methylates DNA. Uh, and there is some communication between this, but it's usually one way. So you can, folate can donate its group to SAM, but then it doesn't go back again. So this is one way of, of separating uh, the compartments. ATP and, and GDP is also actually an interesting compartmentalization. So ATP, as we know, is a major energy carrier, and this is used in most oxidative metabolism and many of the reactions and processes that carry us, carries out work in the cell. Uh, but GTP is actually also a, an important energy carrier. So this triphosphate is used in protein synthesis quite a bit, uh, and so it actually carries quite a bit of energy uh, used for protein synthesis, which is a major process in most cells. Uh, and it's also used in gluconeogenesis uh, and a couple of other anabolic processes. So again, here we have an example of two carriers that or specialize in different processes. So this allows, again, the cell uh, to separate between different metabolic processes and control them independently. So that's an interesting uh, aspect, I think. Now, because cofactors are recycling uh, in metabolic pathways and there is no net consumption uh, or production of these, uh, you would expect that cofactors are only needed in small amounts. So theoretically, if you have a, a non-dividing cell, which just sits around and, and does its metabolic function, uh, you would expect that the demand for a cofactor is zero. And this is true in non-dividing cells, uh, by and large. Uh, if you have proliferating cells, then you have a bit higher demand for cofactors because you have to regenerate the pools uh, of cofactors that cells need in order to carry out metabolism. But still, Generally, the requirements for cofactors is, is low. It's much lower than other nutrients like glucose and amino acids, which are used in large amounts. And you can see this uh, looking at concentrations in, in human plasma or looking at typical formulations of cell culture medium. So if you compare to the levels of nutrients like amino acids, cofactors are in tiny amounts uh, in plasma and in medium. They're typically a couple of orders of magnitude, maybe three orders of magnitude lower uh, than the amino acids uh, and even lower than glucose. Uh, so, so that makes sense. We only need tiny amounts of these because cofactors are regenerated all the time. The exception is when cofactors degrade and this happens uh, to some of the cofactors more than others. Uh, creatine is one example uh, which is continually lost in humans. Uh, there is a spontaneous process where creatine is, is uh, cyclizes and forms a cyclic form called creatinine. Uh, and this can't be recovered uh, by cells, so this is lost in urine all the time. Uh, so I think about a percent or so of the creatine pool is lost daily in this process, and therefore you have to keep synthesizing it. Uh, but so this is a, an exception. And Perhaps we see this type of phenomenon for cofactors because they are generally constant. There is probably some spontaneous degradations of most metabolites, uh, but since cofactors stay around for a long time uh, and recycle in the cells, uh, we tend to observe these degradation behaviors. So that's sort of an exception, but in general, cofactors are required in very small amounts by cells. And now, because cofactors are not required in large amounts, they tend to be vitamins. So why is that? Well, the reasoning goes that since the diet contains a lot more cofactors than uh, the average body will, will use, uh, the synthesis is rarely needed for these cofactors. Unless you have some dietary deficiency or something like that, uh, you usually don't have to synthesize cofactors in large amounts. And therefore, these uh, synthesis enzymes were not very important to animals, and they have been lost at some point in evolution. So cofactors are usually vitamins, because we can't synthesize these anymore. Uh, one example is ascorbate, this is vitamin C. Um, so in many animals, there is a synthesis pathway for ascorbate. Uh, in primates, there is not, so this is an example of a fairly recent loss 
uh, in evolution. Uh, there is uh, an enzyme system that processes ascorbate. It's used to capture uh, free radicals, and then it forms something called monodehydroascorbate. Uh, and then there is the reverse process where this is generated back. Uh, so this enzyme system is present, of course. That's the uh, function uh, of ascorbate in cells. But the net synthesis pathway that would generate this uh, de novo from other substrates is not present anymore. So this is a vitamin. Uh, so there are several of these. Um, some of them are cases where the actual cofactor is the vitamin. Uh, in other cases, it happens that the precursor uh, of an important cofactor is a vitamin. Uh, so one example is coenzyme A. Uh, there is a synthesis pathway for coenzyme A, but we can't make it from scratch. Uh, humans cannot synthesize this from, from, from uh, basic nutrients. Uh, so the vitamin is pentotinate. This is vitamin B5. Uh, and you can recognize this as somewhere here. This is a part uh, of the coenzyme A molecule. So we have a synthesis pathway that can, you know, you can look at this, you can add on a purine, there's a ribose, there's a couple of phosphates here. Uh, so we can modify pentothenate and make coenzyme A. But pentothenate is a, is a precursor. Uh, so again, this is an example of a cofactor that has become a vitamin, in a sense, uh, because there, there is very little demand for it, and the diet usually contains plenty of pentothenate. Now... An interesting consequence of this idea that cofactors turn over rapidly and continuously is that the active form of a cofactor cannot really be provided to cells. Uh, so this is maybe a bit controversial, but I'll explain what I mean. So if you think about ADP and ATP, uh, there is a very quick turnover uh, of ATP in cells. We have, we have seen this in, in previous lectures as well. Uh, so the cells use as the the phosphorylated form very quickly, and then it regenerates, and then it's used very quickly again. So quick turnover. On the other hand, the de novo synthesis of the actual ADP moiety is usually very slow in comparison. So it's really only uh, the metabolism of this phosphate group that is really fast. So that means that it's very hard uh, if you imagine that you would provide ATP to cells in this form, the whole uh, nucleotide. You would have to provide it at very rapid rates, uh, and there would be a lot of ADP produced that the cells would have to get rid of for, these, uh, for this system to function. Uh, so that generally doesn't happen. It's very hard to sort of drive a cell by exogenous ATP. This has to happen endogenously. Uh, so the uh, rates of de novo entry uh, into these cofactor pools are slow, uh, whereas the turnover is fast. And therefore, it's very hard to provide ATP as a kind of raw substrate to cells. So this becomes interesting in some cases. So antioxidants is a case in point. So is it really possible to provide antioxidants or to take antioxidants in your diet? Well, you might think that it's not because it's the same principle. So ascorbate, for example, vitamin C, turns over very rapidly as it is capturing free radicals to generate the monodehydro form, uh, and then it's regenerated back again using an ADPH. Uh, whereas the uptake of this vitamin is, is slow from the diet. You don't need to replenish the actual pool very quickly. So if you would actually provide these antioxidants to cells uh, for the purpose of capturing free radicals, you would have to do it very rapidly, and it would generate a lot uh, of uh, of, the, of the product, uh, the dehydroscorbate, uh, as a consequence, and that would have to be expelled as, as waste very quickly. Uh, so from looking at these um, principles and looking at the turnover rates, you would expect that cofactors cannot be provided in this way. So that's a bit of a controversial topic uh, in the literature, I think, uh, but it's an interesting prediction from, from looking at metabolism this way.